The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss composting in your backyard, as well as how much work is needed for a successful garden. Our guests are co-authors Stephanie Thurl and Michelle Brune, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another edition of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy that you've tuned in the program. I am Joy Baird. Next to me is my co-host, best friend and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Appreciate you tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies, broadcasting our program here in 2023. On our parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, underneath the Season 7 tab at the top of the page, or anywhere in between. If you want to be on podcast replay or in studio video replay, if you want to be part of the program, send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com with your questions. Gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or anytime, you can give us a call 24 7 to our hotline at 1 800 927 SHOW. It's 1 800 927 74. Six nine. Well, Holly, composting is something that we all either are not doing and should be doing or are doing and cannot produce enough compost for our gardens, but we are saving the waste from going into the landfills. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think that many people think that composting has to be compl- complicated or for some reason maybe expensive in a way or that they're going to attract um you know, unwanted wildlife to their yard. And these are valid concerns, but maybe we should bust some of those myths. Okay. So if you're in a rural setting, you can pretty much put anything in the compost you want. If it's far enough away from your residence, but raccoons and possums and stuff are going to get in there and turn her over to eat the meat or, or dig through for bugs. So it's kind of aerating itself. If you're in a, a sur- suburban or urban setting, you want to avoid uh, milk, dairy, meat, bones, because that's going to attract those unwanted animals into your property. Right. And another thing you can do is if you are concerned about maybe your municipality or your HOA, you can find out what the rules are, if there are any, or maybe you've heard a neighbor say like, you know, this community has rules about composting. Most do. And most do. And that's totally valid. So you can find out the rules. A lot of times the rules are just that it needs to be contained. Some of them, uh, I've spoken to some people where they have to, has to be enclosed, whether it's in a tumbler or something with a lid, some type of uh, way in which it prevents the material from getting spread apart or dispersed or, or dug through. So um, keep that in mind. And there's hundreds of different types of composting uh, apparatuses that you can put your compost in, whether it is on the ground in a couple of self-made pallet uh, uh, boxes or a tumbler or some type of mechanism in order to heat the compost to get it to the adequate temperature, which is, uh, I think it's 170 degrees, 100 and 60 degrees for 72 hours, something like that, to kill the viable seeds, uh, core temperature. And, and some you, you uh, mix, some you uh, turn a, a lever in order for it to make it mix. And there are two forms of composting, hot and cold. Right. And so hot compost, so cold composting is when you just basically toss your compostable material into a bin or a pile or... And let it be. Let it be. And then hot composting is... It's two things now. It's when you either buy a composter bin Uh um, that is meant for hot composting or kind of the sped up composting. And then the second one is the traditional hot composting where you're mixing um, a certain amount of nitrogens or greens to browns, which is Uh, easy, easy ratio is 50, 50. Yeah. And so what happens is that that nitrogen will help break up the compost and also break down those seeds 
and then it it's that hop it does make the composting happen a little bit faster and a lot of times you do have to um, mix it up a bit more so a lot of people who hot compost will compost in something that is um, either contained but has a large opening or even like those rolling compost tumblers tumblers that's the word um, things like that. So uh, hot composting kills the seeds if done correctly, and you can do it like in you know in, within a tumbler or on the ground. Cold composting, you're going to break the materials down. It's going to take a prolonged period of time. If time is not an issue for you, you just do not feel comfortable throwing it in the trash, or you just have a pile way out in the back, and you take a bucket every couple of days back there, and over the course of two, three years, then you have a big pile of compost. Those. That, that cold composting, when you cold compost, it's not, you know, cold per se. There is some aerobic activity inside of that composting pile, but it's not going to get to the elevated temperatures to kill all the viability in the seeds, the weed seeds that you are mixing in. Uh, yeah. So... so uh, you're going to have weed seeds that are going to sprout when you utilize this compost in your garden. So keep that in mind that whenever you use it, yes, it's compost. It's black. It's, it's what you want. But if it's in the cold composting state, you're going to have seeds of weeds that are going to sprout. So one thing you can do, and we'll just, I'm just going to get off topic a teeny okay. bit, is if you use that compost in your garden you want your concern about the weed seeds creating weeds, you can always put it at the bottom, like maybe you have a, you're trying to fill a raised bed uh -huh. or even just some sort of large container. You can put that at the bottom of, of your container and that will help not give the weeds. Prevent. A, yeah. Prevent the weeds from growing. Um, and that's fine. Otherwise, um, when you do plant, if you, that's your only option to plant in, you can mulch. Mulch helps suppress, mm -hmm. suppress weeds. Um, based, and, based on how big your pile is, if it is to the point where, okay, it's composted, it's completed, you could cover it with a black tarp in order to intensify that heat into the pile to try to kill off a few more of those seeds. But the percentile in which you're going to kill off will be some, but not substantial. You're still going to have. But the convenience of that cold composting is throw it in, walk away, and forget it. You don't have to uh, tumble it. You don't have to mix it. You don't have to figure out the ratio. It's just dump and go. And it can be applicable in certain applications much more than the hot composting in which you you want to do and you fill raised beds and you have no weeds and it looks pristine and magazine cover wonderful um there's their pros and cons to both of them absolutely and i think that if if you are realistic about the composting process you can find something that that works well for you and your needs and and whatever your however busy you are but i would thoroughly completely recommend composting if you can do it and then there are things like kitchen composting where you can get little composters another thing to keep in mind is that even if you're not going to compost um you can always just if you have a garden you want to toss in some kitchen items as you're planting trench you can, planting yeah do a little or bit trench, of trench composting trench composting and then another thing to keep in mind is if something says it's compostable like a packaging i know um Sometimes the grocery stores where, stores where I shop the produce bags say compostable. If you don't put those things into soil or compost or whatever, they're just going to go into the landfill. They're not going to compost down. Correct. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. But it doesn't indicate some, – sometimes it doesn't indicate the time in which it takes to break down. It may take five or ten years to break down, but it will break down. But it takes five to ten years to break down. Yeah, and that's, that's very true. But a lot of these are these – um, plastic produce bags and you can tell you can feel the difference when the, uh -huh. the compostable ones versus the traditional or whatever you you're want right to call it. right yeah so yeah so composting it can be very sim uh, simplistic or it can be very complex however you want to look at it between hot composting and cold composting kitchen composting or scrap uh, trench composting or you can even do vermicomposting where you incorporate worms whether it's inside or in a climatized environment to where the worms are not going to 
be too cold or too warm, and you can incorporate your kitchen scraps into that mechanism in order for the worms to break it down naturally, and then you have worm castings and uh, a very good material in order to start seeds in and or dress around side dress plants and feed them the worm castings that um, you can benefit your plant your your plants can benefit from. Absolutely. And there's and and, and worm, com worm composting, if done right, it does not smell. And there's certain uh, ways to do it, either customized DIY or uh, commercially available kits in which you can create a worm composting bin and you get the worm or the compost juice and then also the worm castings and a lot of benefits and it's a way to get young people into composting as well and the benefit to worm compost bins the worms are smarter probably than some humans uh, because <laughs> they don't overpopulate their colony once nice. their colony reaches a certain population they stop reproducing that is the, that's the, the unique aspect of worm composting. And you can always break that colony apart and split it in half, and then those two colonies will begin to reproduce again because they see there's a vacancy in population and they have to fulfill the requirements that the worms know internally. So it's really neat. Worms are very smart. Right. Yes. So you could be smart too. With Walton's Incorporated? Yes, with okay. Walton's Incorporated. So Walton's Incorporated has everything you need um, to go from animal to edible. They So we know you care about your garden, your composting, your canning, vegetables, whatever. But at Walton's, you can get the equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want to make delicious snack sticks? They have an online community called MeatJustSticks.com to help educate people on the hows and whys of meat processing. And they have almost over 15,000 users. And then they have... Um, Grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, they use Excalibur seasonings, the same exact ones that professional processors use. They have all sorts of great stuff, and that's at waltonsinc.com. The website for the community of meat processors is meatjustics.com. So if you go to waltonsinc.com, you use code GROW50, you save 10% off orders of $50 or more. Hang out with us when we come back. We're going to discuss that age-old question, how much work is needed to have a successful garden. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. Their belts are minimalist and one-of-a-kind with no holes or flap hanging over. Designs and styles for men and women. Something for everyone. Versatile to mix and match fashionable buckles and belt webbing. Colorful or timeless designs to match your style. You know how bulky and uncomfortable a belt can be, but not a problem with the Grip6 belt. Comfortable but durable, a belt that moves and works with you and your lifestyle. Perfect for all the bending, twisting, shifting, and moving during gardening, yard work, and all of your everyday life. It's almost like you're not wearing a belt at all. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6.com. Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in to check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest and their vegetables are incesticide free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus, take care of your lawn with grass seed fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer, you may visit them also online at shapenmfg.com to learn more and buy online. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. 
Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. A non-selective herbicide that is USDA certified? Yup, no more weeds by Naturally Green Products. The same great company that brings you no more bugs. No more weeds kills weeds with no harsh chemicals and no glyphosate. No more weeds is a commercial grade vinegar base with a proprietary sticking agent. Great around pools, decks, patios, and more. Visit natgreenproducts.com. Free shipping on orders over $50 using code free ship for me make watering easy dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the u.s and canada purchase online at dripworks.com the gardening with joy and holly radio show is brought to you by the following dripworks rise gardens grip six bloom and easy fleet farm waltons incorporated blue ribbon organics tree diaper Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Happy you've taken time out of your day and allow us to be part of yours. Moments away, what does it take to really have a successful garden? But first, a tool in which you can use to have a successful garden with Farmer's Defense. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin. For any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker, say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves after cooling offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing. Farmer's Defense is made of wicking materials UBF Protection Factor 50 Plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all of their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. Well, people often ask, boy, it must be a lot of work in order to have a garden. Your garden's beautiful, but boy, you must spend a lot of time working on it. Well, there's some truth to that, and there's some um, additional information that it does get easier with time. But with any project, whether you are refurbishing, refurbishing a car or a uh, collection of some sort or working in the yard, it takes time in order to achieve what you want to see have happen. Same with a garden. It takes time in order to prep the soil and find the plants you want and plant it, maintain it, manicure it, and then harvest it and then know what to do with the harvest when you harvest it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, I think one of the biggest things is that it's um, maybe work smarter, not harder. Okay. And so when you're, when you are, if, I think if you and I were to start over from scratch. Yes. 12 or 11, however many years ago, we would have done raised beds sooner. Right. And even with those raised beds, we would have put some sort of weed barrier down. Right. We put weed barrier down in the form of cardboard uh, but that did not stop the thistles from making their way up through 10 inches of compost. That has subsided substantially since we have stressed the thistles out by continually going and cutting them as deep as possible in the raised bed. And then as they come again, recutting them and stressing the root out until it uh, dies off. Right. And you just sometimes can't, you can't help, I guess, or stop nature. And Harsh think, chemicals can, but right. it's not recommended for your edible garden. Right. So there's just going to be things like thistles and certain grasses. Like we have a lot of creeping charlie. It's a very aggressive um, weed and it spreads fast and quickly and it's super invasive. Evil, invasive. Yep. So there's certain things that you just can't control. But what you can control is thinking forward. And I, I know it wasn't when we first started gardening, we we really didn't together, not in general, but together, we didn't really have like a lot of funds either. No, limited so, funds. Yeah. A lot of free material found along the side of the road. 
and the knowledge and experience based on our past in order to utilize those items in which we had found or got on a very cheap and uh, low price in order to maximize the produce and the garden in which we had and was successful at it. Right. And so these are things that you have to keep in mind is maybe you, you're you're going to start somewhere and also as you get you know either become more financially stable or wiser like, wiser i guess and also perhaps as your body gets a little bit older you might think about how you want to change things because part of working in a garden is you are using your body so some people might just start right away with um raised beds or like a planting table or something that is more I guess labor less labor intensive to to plant in to grow into weed or perhaps maybe you just don't want to deal with a backyard garden and you want to do something like um, containers or pots or uh, straw bales or something that is not as taking over your yard. Well, and we have guests on this program each and every week, and they discuss ways in which they have uh, changed their gardening uh, routine because as, uh, the, uh, because they have aged. And w many of you who have gardened for decades can tell the stories that you once did this, and because of a certain event or time frame, you have altered the way you're gardening, and now you're doing it this way, and it may not be as big as it once was, and you have downsized, but you continue to garden, and the knowledge in which you have gathered over those decades have as, uh, has allowed you, in some instances, to produce just as much now in a smaller area than what you were able to produce in a larger area many, many years ago. And also technology has allowed us to uh, advance in that realm of education and materials and quality of seeds and tools uh, in order to make the gardening more efficient and effective rather than uh, what we, what we, our grandparents have had done many years ago. Uh, intercropping, um, square foot gardening, not the traditional agricultural rows that many of us grew up with. You've got, you know, five bean rows, four corn rows, you know, that type of thing where it's very spaced out. We understand that we can put these plants slightly closer together to maximize the space in which we have available. And maybe you don't have any space available and you've found that you were easily able to find a community garden or any other sort of technological advancement or, or even something like a, a rise garden that you can have in your home. Right. So is it difficult? Is it uh, what amount of work goes into it? Every equation is calculated differently in the amount of work that goes into it. The overwhelmingly uh, gen general formulation for how much work does it take to have a successful garden is how much work do you want to put into it? How much have you established already? Have you already have raised beds established or a ground garden that is established that you have weeded diligently over the course of many years? And now it's to the point where there's very minimal amount of weeds that are coming up year after year because of that amount of work in which you've done for decades in order to purify that soil from those weed seeds. Right, and sometimes it's just about you know, being realistic with not, not maybe overwhelming yourself. So you might have a neighbor who is a retired and they have half the day to spend pruning everything and plucking everything and all of this stuff. And that's maybe why they have a beautiful garden because they have all that time to, to do that. Or on the flip side, maybe somebody else in their 20s has a beautiful garden because they have the energy to do all of that. If you are middle age like Joey and myself, we still have energy to do it. We don't necessarily have time. And that goes with a lot of things in life because we have other hobbies and activities that we enjoy. So we can still garden 
but also with respect to the fact that we have other things that we want to do in our lives. The other thing is the priority. Is it is it a do or die? We have to have a big garden because we don't have the finances to go buy groceries or we choose not to buy groceries because of the concerns that we have of what the food is, what's in the food that we are potentially buying from the grocery store. So there is a mindset of we don't have a choice. We have to make this work because this is the healthiest way in which we feel that we can live is by producing as much produce as we can and exponentially out livestock and or fungi that people produce on a homestead to be more self-sustainable so they don't have to rely on other people or other means of uh, government level things that they can take care of themselves and it comes down is it successful why is it success why is it successful because i we are having to make this work we don't have an alternative we are choosing to make this be successful because that is the best thing for our family so when you talk about having a fungi in the garden you're talking about you or you're talking about mushrooms mushrooms oh, okay yeah do you like my joke yeah it's a it's a repetitive <laughs> joke that gets less funny every time why because i always say it? it it's lost its baboom what about when I used to say we cantaloupe because we're already married. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's getting there, too. That's getting there, too. But you understand what I'm saying, that some people... I bet there's somebody who enjoys my joke. Probably. TW, uh, Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. There you go. Uh, but there are. how much work does it take to make a successful garden? It all dep- depends on the mindset or the uh, reasoning or the purpose of the garden. Hobby or food production for family or a way to retract yourself from the demand the, 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 that you're not de- uh, requiring or, or needing, um, or, or I forget what the word is, you're not expecting or um, looking towards assistance by going to the grocery store. You're becoming more self-sustainable and healthier uh, on the food that you're growing. Absolutely. And again, it's just something that you, you have to determine for yourself. But it is work regardless, whether it's a hobby or it is a lifestyle, there is work that goes into everything that you in life are able to make successful. And there are ways to, to be smart about it. And that's, that's the biggest thing is there's technological advances. There's many different methods of gardening and you don't have to limit yourself to just one, one type of gardening or one way of gardening well if you want to control the beetles and grubs invader invaders without affecting the rest of your ecosystem in your yard then grub gone and beetle gone are the solution phylums grub gone and beetle gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles weevils borers without harming non-targets such as bees ladybugs butterflies earthworms or other beneficial insects you can purchase these products locally in massachusetts at words nursery McHugh Garden Center and Hyannis Country Garden in Connecticut or at Van Williams Garden Center in Maine at Salisbury Organics in New York at Fettigan Nursery in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. Phylum Bioproducts target the pest, not the rest. That is P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Holly, when we come back to who we have coming on, our guests are... We have Michelle Thoreau uh-huh. and... Stephanie. Stephanie Brune. Yeah. Yep. When we come back, co-authors, you're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at JungSeeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. 
Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy to install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit Aqua-Mart.com to shop for all your needs. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. You put a lot of time and energy in your garden, but without a rescue Japanese beetle trap, you can kiss that hard work goodbye. Asparagus annihilated. Raspberries ravished. Green beans, forget about it. Get those little invasive pests out of your garden and send them where they belong inside a rescue Japanese beetle trap. Now with available refill lures, rescue Japanese beetle traps can be used for multiple seasons. They're made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot com. Hi, I'm Russell Taylor with Live Earth Products. I'm a soil health expert here to help you. Live Earth Products specializes in soil conditioners and fertilizers that will help you build healthy and vibrant flower and vegetable gardens. As our name describes, Live Earth means healthy soils. Live Earth Products are humic and fulvic soil amendments and are all natural, organic, and directly from our family mine in Utah. Live Earth products are easy to apply, and the results will blossom right before your eyes. Live Earth products can be applied throughout the growing season. So pick up Live Earth Humate Soil Conditioner, our Liquid 6 Humic Acid, at your local garden center or on Amazon. Also available through our website, liveearth.com, that's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. Live Earth, here to bring vitality to life in your garden. The Garden with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, co-authors Stephanie and Michelle will be with us with their new book about homesteading. But first, a word from Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app, step-by-step Guidance from seed to harvest, a complete garden on a shelf, and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, you can go to risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Yes, with over 35 years of combined experience, homesteaders Stephanie Thurow and Michelle Brune have taught thousands of people across the globe how to garden, preserve food, tend backyard chickens, cook from scratch, and care for their families with natural homemade alternatives. Now their home study knowledge and instruction can be found in one place with a small-scale homesteading book. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. Well, you're very yeah, thanks, guys. You're welcome for and thank you for coming on the program and and we've got some questions to ask you and and we'll kind of direct to whom we want to ask it so we don't step on each other since we're well, this is one of the few times that we're excited to have multiple guests on. So I'll start with you, Stephanie. What is homesteading and what qualifies someone to be a homesteader? Well, uh, Michelle and I believe that. Any home can be a homestead. You don't need acres of land. In fact, um, we both live in the suburbs of Minneapolis, so we don't have a ton of space. But but just basically trying to do more with whatever space that you do have. Um, Homesteading usually involves growing your own food, such as fruits and vegetables, um, raising some sort of livestock. Like we both have small backyard flocks of chickens that we raise for eggs. Um, And then generally, homesteaders will preserve their own food using one of the many methods such as canning, fermenting, freezing, or dehydrates. And, um, and so, yeah, what qualifies someone, you could be a homesteader if you just have a, 
a little herb garden or grow a couple of tomatoes in pots. I mean, whatever, wherever you begin and whatever really interests you. Right, Michelle, what do you, what do you think qualifies someone? Yeah, I think it's really a lot of a frame of mind, maybe. Um, and it's really, I think, using your home as a, not just a place of consumption, but as a place of production so that you can really do so much where, wherever you're at. Um, and preserving food from the farmer's markets, if you can't grow a lot yourself, it's, it's really almost a frame of mind more than anything else. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people have that misconception. I can't be a homesteader because I don't have fill in the blank number of acres or fill in the blank number of animals or size of garden, fill in the blank. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, people that don't personally know us think that we have acres of land because we do so much, but we don't. We live in, you know, regular neighborhoods like many of our our, our internet friends. <laughs> Thanks for thinking that, but... <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, Stephanie, you are a master food preserver. What does that mean exactly, and how do you become a master food preserver? Yeah, so what that means if someone's a master food preserver is it means that they've completed the intensive hands-on course, um, learning all the up-to-date, tested, USDA-approved methods for home food preservation. Um, these courses are generally offered to locals, like through their extension service offices in the county where they live. Um, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Hennepin County, and due to budget cuts, they had to cut out this course years ago. And so um, each county seems to do the layout of the course a little bit differently. Like sometimes it's over three days, sometimes it's over many weeks. And I actually went to Hawaii to get my certification and it was over two and a half weeks. Um, but yeah, once you're certified, you're required to help others within your community learn safe and approved methods of how to preserve food. Um, it's similar to the Master Gardeners volunteers where they're required to volunteer a number of hours each year. And so it's kind of a two-part deal. It's just you're learning all the safe methods and you're learning how to teach other people how to do it safely. Well, before we talk about your your book that you co-authored, uh, Michelle, how did you guys come together and decide, hey, let's work together and write this book? Yeah, well, um, like, you know, all good friendships, we met on Instagram. <laughs> 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 it's kind of funny. Um, we, we did, but we were, I mean, in some ways, social media can bring the right people together because we were just all in the same circles in the same kind of area. And so we're like, hey, you garden, you do this, you have chickens, you do maple syruping. So we got to be good friends on Instagram. And then we met in person when Stephanie um, agreed to teach a class at a winter farmer's market that I run. So we finally got to meet in person a good couple years after we'd been um, social media friends. And then it just kind of it stuck um, and we had a lot of fun and then Stephanie had the idea to um, write another book and um, she's written cookbooks before which are phenomenal um, and she went to her publisher and said hey maybe we should do another one of these um, and they wanted it a more of a general scope um, all about homesteading and she said hey Michelle maybe you would like to help me with this gardening chunk of this um, we're both master gardeners as well Stephanie is multi multi-talented um, but I am like a, an absolute garden nerd. I love gardening so, so much. So that's kind of how it fit together. And um, it was a really fun process. You know, you just never know how you're going to really work with someone. And it was so much fun, Stephanie, to work with you. <laughs> New deal. <laughs> much like a marriage or a relationship. Well, yeah, it was a big risk, but I think the fact that we weren't like in person close friends, we, you know, you have like boundaries. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, it worked out really well. You feel comfortable saying, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And, yeah. We did, and it was respectful, which sometimes when you're too close to someone, you, you don't always have the most respectful responses. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Good boundaries, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I know like for us, we've had people asked to come tour our garden and then we're like it's it's a vegetable garden like what i yeah. don't know but <laughs> anyway. there, there, there's there's reasons why we're limited on the information of where it's located because we don't know you right right uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> all right so with that being said please tell us about your book the small scale homesteading book and um maybe something that would pique our listeners interest get them excited 
Yeah. So in the book, we wrote about all the things that we actually do. So it's the way we do things. And what I think is unique about it is that Michelle and I have different methods for what we do. We get the same end point, but we don't necessarily do things the same way. And we put that into the book. So it's broken down into um, chapters, a garden chapter. It's very detailed. Um, Michelle, do you want to talk about the garden chapter? (laughs) Um, well, it just, yeah, it goes through planning and, um, growing, tending, dealing with pests, companion planting, seed starting, pest, yeah, issues. And then, um, yeah, then it jumps, it it goes pretty in depth into all those things. And then we dive into food preservation in the next chapter. Yeah, but we talk about all the different methods that you can use, you know, safely from your home. Um, we have a chapter on making your own maple syrup. Michelle and I each have one big maple, uh, silver maple tree in our yards that we tap each spring and we get enough syrup from that one tree to provide us with syrup for the whole year for our families and sometimes friends. Um, and then we have a chicken keeping chapter. We talk about, you know, from day one old chicks all the way through end of life and taking care of them in the extreme heat and extreme cold that we get here in Minnesota. And then we have a healthy home chapter where we have some recipes in there and then, you know, candle making, how to make lotions and salves and infuse oils and and vinegars and stuff like that. Well, Michelle, I'll ask you about chickens real quick. In, In the perfect scenario, are chickens better to in a cold situation or extreme hot situation? Or is there is it da- is it dangerous either way? Um, well, it's, it, even in our extreme cold up in Zone Four, where Stephanie and I both are, I would still say, in actuality, they they might do better in extreme cold than extreme heat. They can really suffer. It's that we're more aware, I think, as human beings, like we feel the cold more. Um, but they actually probably feel the heat more because they, they're they wearing down vests. Right. Think about it. Like, wearing down jackets the whole time. So, um, yeah, they they show signs of frostbite and stuff a lot faster than they show signs of, like, heat exhaustion or dehydration. Well, uh, Stephanie, I'll, I'll ask you this because we see this so much on social media. What is the biggest mistake you've seen recently for new canners to make that the new canners make, and why do people not want to can correctly based on all the scientific information that we have in the world? That if you don't do it right, you could die. And people are like, I don't know, I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it this way, even though it's wrong. Well, you know, because great grandma did it and great great grandma did it and they didn't die. That's what I hear all the time. Um, So, yeah, definitely follow the tested recipes. Um, That is the biggest mistake, but it's hard. I think it's confusing because there are big, big influencers, you know, with huge followings and they share these things as kind of a matter of fact way and people believe well, it's and it, would you say would it. you say people are doing it because if i say it i'll get clicks and if i get clicks i get dollars and we're just going to go down that route even if it's wrong i don't think that they take the time to even know that it's wrong and okay. that's the scary part i really do so yeah just make sure that you're following people that you can trust that have uh knowledge or you know like the ball canning books those are tested as, you know, those are a great resource, especially for beginners, you know, start there and then you start learning. Okay. I need to, you know, have this much vinegar and this much water. And then you kind of learn what you can tweak with water bath canning. I don't tweak anything when it comes to pressure canning and I don't recommend anyone else does either. Um, follow those trusted recipes. Well, I mean, 50 years ago, half gallon jars was all the rage because we had big families and we fill them. And now, and when you look at what you can put in a half gallon jar, there is very few items that is safe per the uh, ball canning and all the resources that are recommended that you use a half gallon jar for. Right. And, you know, sure, grandma, grandma was OK, but they're learning why it's not OK. And that's why we need to um, adapt. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um so one more one more question we have for you is what is the biggest challenge of small scale homesteading? What do you think on that one, Michelle? Yeah, well, I mean there's I suppose like lots of different challenges based on where your homestead is, I guess really. Um but and this might sound funny, but the biggest challenge might be giving yourself some grace at the beginning of the process, not expecting yourself to like know it all right away, taking it slow enough. Um, not needing to like, you know, take it on all at once. And think about gardening. You learn so much with each season. And so 
think of it as like, you know, a marathon, not a sprint. This is like a lifelong, you know, journey with really no end point. Hopefully (laughs) we're not thinking like that. We're thinking about, you know, living a little bit closer to nature, living a little bit um, healthier life for yourself, for your family, probably for the pollinators around your yard, for the whole ecosystem. And I think if we can keep that kind of in mind that we are part of nature, um, I think that that will really help us in the journey of um, staying excited about small-scale homesteading, too. And whether you're small-scale homesteading or your regular homesteading or your farm, double the time you think a project's going to take. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody, sure. yeah. yeah, somebody asked um, if we ever dream of, you know, moving to the acre, acres of land. We have lots of farms around here. And Michelle and I both did have that dream at one point. But now knowing the effort it takes to keep our, you know, suburban homesteads running, I really don't know if I if I have the energy to do acres of yeah. land. So you're right about that. Yeah, 24 seven, and it's it's nine days a week and 30 hours a day on a, on a big homestead. And, and that math doesn't add up and it never will. Right. No, I, yeah, no, and that's why we're so grateful for our farmers as small scale homesteaders. If we are, you know, urban and suburban, we depend on our farmers, and our local um, farmers are just so amazing, and they they're the hardest working people I know for sure. Wow. Well, we greatly appreciate you two ladies coming on the program. How can we find out more about you and find your book? We'll start with you, Stephanie, and then Michelle. If you can let us know how we can get a hold of you and find you as well. Sure. Our book, Small Scale Homesteading, is available worldwide wherever books are sold online and lots of brick and mortar stores. We just don't have a list, but we do know that they are available at most tractor supply supply stores across the country. Um, And then we're both really active on Instagram. I'm Minnesota from scratch. My website is Minnesota from scratch. And you can find me on Facebook if you search Minnesota from scratch. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. And I am known as Forks in the Dirt on uh, my website and Instagram and Facebook. And you can also sign up for monthly emails on my website. Um, and ForksInTheDirt.com also has a lot of great information about our book and how it came to be as well. Well, we greatly appreciate the time that you two have offered us and uh, the information you've shared with us. And we thank you for that, not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You know what's different about Verlo Mattress? Everything. Like no price gouging, no shenanigans, none of the shady dealings of other mattress chains and furniture stores that overcharge for virtually the same mattress. The ripoff stops here. Furlough makes every mattress they sell, so you get better quality, lower prices, and a lifetime comfort guarantee. Because at the end of the day, you don't deserve shenanigans, you deserve a good night's sleep. Wake up, sleep better. Verlo. Dripping Springs Oyas Clay Pot Irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. 
Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your day-to-day, whether you are listening to us live on the radio or podcast replay or in-studio video replay. Thank you very much. It's time for your garden questions, our garden answers. If you've got a question, send it on over via email. one option at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or if you're the talkie type, you can give us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. And don't forget, you can let us know if you like my little fungi joke. Yes, yeah. If you like Holly's jokes, let us know about that, too. They'll keep (laughs) coming or we'll shut it down. All right. So this question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. I harvested my spring crops and planted my summer crops without adding anything extra to my garden bed. Should I have added a little something to the soil, maybe like some compost or fertilizer? Is it too late? Does it matter? What should I do? Okay, revitalizing the soil after removing the summer or the, the spring crops based on the condition of your soil, you may be able to get away with it. But just a general rule of thumb, it's not going to hurt to top dress or add compost to your garden bed. However, if you've already planted your garden and uh, it's already coming up, there's a couple of options in which you have. You can take compost and side dress or put around the plants in which you have already put in the ground just uh you know a, a small trowel full or make a little berm around the plants and as it waters or as you water it rains it will work that into the soil and around the roots you can also put soil or compost uh down the center rows next to the plants and as it waters you rain it rains however you want to do it it'll work it's in the so- work its way into the soil you can also use an organic liquid or granular fertilizer and put that around the plants as well if you're using a granular fertilizer you want to use something not over powerful keep it under the 10 10 10 mark and you can put it around the plants at the base and or once you put it around the base of the plant, you can cover it with compost. Or you want to do a watering uh, schedule, you can water it based on the recommended rates or the instructions on the back of the fertilizer packages. The safest route to go is just add compost uh, around the plants or in the general area in which you have planted. If you've done like seedlings or whatever, you're, or seeds, you kind of got to wait for that to come up, but that's you can put it between the rows and you will feed the soil. Then when you harvest your fall, your spring, your summer for your fall if you're able to plant you want to top dress the beds with about a half to an inch of compost so that is the that is a good way of keeping it every time you pull something out add an inch of compost back in that area to revitalize the soil all right so our next question is from denise i was watching your video about tomatoes and you said that use the florida weave method in a 10 by 3 bed were the tomatoes indeterminate or determinate? And if they were indeterminate, did you remove any of the suckers? So um, thank you for watching the video and thank you for your question. The bed of tomatoes were both indeterminate and determinate. We personally do not cut off the suckers. We feel like the suckers grow on the plant. They're just part of the plants. They produce a limb. They produce more fruit. We're very much, um, I guess, live and let live, live in harmony well, we with have, our nature. We have, you know, 40, 50, 60 well, tomatoes too. too. Yeah, absolutely. And for some people, I know even if they, maybe they don't, they don't really have a strong opinion about letting the suckers grow, but they do like to prune them because it's relaxing for them. That's perfectly fine as well. We just let them grow as is. 
All right, yes, and and uh, keep that in mind that you can pack a lot more plants in a small area by doing a Florida weave, which is the plants are growing up and hanging on string rather than cages where there's a limitation because of the size of the cage. We are able to pack a few more plants in, let's say, a 10-foot row than we would if we had cages. And the plants are able to grow very they're easier to harvest too because you're not fighting cages you're just reaching in and harvesting the plant so florida weave if you've already got your tomatoes planted many of us have and you haven't caged them yet look up florida weave you can go to our parent website the wisconsin vegetable and in the right hand side search bar type that in we've got several videos instructing how to do such and it works very well we use agricultural twine uh that works uh that does not rot some people choose to use more uh or organic means of support so there you go all right i've tried growing in compost only to uh, only but it seems to have the difficulty to allow water to permeate through the compost got hard and nothing really grew well in it maybe it is the type of compost i used it's the compost from the nursery that came in the bag thanks um, well, what you could use... Compost, it, not all compost is created equal. No, you can buy compost from the nursery and it can be not not the best. Right. Yeah. A lot of rocks, a lot yeah. of plastic, uh, big chunks of stuff, uh, improper ratio of materials mixed in with it. So you... So what you can do is you can mix in some potting soil with the compost and then you could even perhaps use uh, mulch on the top or mix in some natural materials like if you have any leaves dried grass clippings um yeah i don't know yeah. maybe maybe even your own compost if you have any of that something to kind of break it up a little bit and allow it to to mix with something so that it, the water can go through and it won't get that crustiness uh we've been able to grow successful many times in compost we got our compost from a very reputable source uh when we did do it in that method in containers many years ago and it was it would crust over on the top but the plant had already emerged out of the soil so that actually worked in our benefit because that crust created a level of natural mulch because it kept the moisture from evaporating out so it, goods and bads there but yes uh, mix a lot of things into it there and uh, you will be able to have compost that will retain the moisture allow excess to run off and your plants will be able to grow successfully keep in mind that again don't buy that compost again uh, in the bag uh, look for a better formulation and oftentimes as much and as difficult as it is the better the compost, the higher the price. El cheapo stuff is el cheapo stuff for a reason. Yeah, you definitely get what you pay for with compost. And um, if I if if it was me, I would definitely reach out to the garden center and let them know what's going on too. All right, what may help? In, uh, uh, I'm looking to see if you can help me. I have a ten by twenty bed of sweet corn that was planted at the same all at the same time and is about two to three foot tall now and it's tasseling i know that i haven't been the best at watering but why is it tasseling at this point in the uh, time frame and uh can you help me what should i do well um early corn tasseling is when plants are stressed so you're correct it could have been the water or maybe the corn was exposed to cold temperatures early in the growing season, something like that. There's a, a few different reasons. Most you're kind times of, it's the lack of water. Yeah. yeah. Most of the time, the, the lack of water, because this happened in your sister's backyard, it was warm. We planted it. It got two to three foot tall and it just all shot to tassel, meaning it was in, it was its stressed position and it was trying to put any type of kernel on the ear in order to create a <clears throat> seed for the next generation. Um, so it is a, a tr uh, corn requires a tremendous amount of water and regular water and keeping that soil moist will allow the plant based on the variety to grow to the designated height in which it's required to in order to put on the ear at the appropriate time there are some 70 days some 80 days some 90 day a little bit longer corn so at this point your corn is no good rip it out throw it in the compost pile 
and then uh, replant because you got plenty of time. Well, speaking of time, Holly, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it, you can certainly do that by going to your favorite search engine and searching the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show, or you can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to this segment or this, this show. Tune in next week. Tune in next week to the program where we'll be discussing fall garden preparation and what is eating my plants. A wonderful question that many of you have. Our guest is the urban farm. uh, Go Greg Greg Peterson. Greg Peterson. He is the founder uh, of the urban farm. It is a dedicated to be your go to resource for online food and growing education. So until next week for. Hi, Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>